Hello and welcome to another edition of For the Record. I'm Sean Murphy. My guest today is Scott Wilson. He is the president of the of CCDL. That's Connecticut Citizens Defense League. It's his first time on the show. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on your show. Uh, you know, you've been... Uh, You've been on in my building, radio station, uh, called in, and now I'm having you on the TV show. Uh, for those that don't know what the Connecticut Citizens Defense League is, tell them what it is. Well, the Connecticut Citizens Defense League uh, is, uh, we are a grassroots gun rights organization, and we are set up uh, operating throughout the state, helping those that uh, seek to obtain pistol permits, those that already own firearms, uh, we we help them pres help them preserve their rights to own and keep their firearms. How did it come about, and how long ago did it come about, and what what was the reason why it was decided that an organization like this was needed? Well, it came about uh, for for a number of different reasons. There, uh, the founders of w w myself is included in. Um, we uh, had never met each other, and we had met in an online uh, firearms enthusiast forum, and we're talking and. Um, it seemed around that time that there were a lot of uh, laws that were year after year, maybe a law would pass that would hurt, hurt gun owners, uh, and then the next year another law would pass. So it seemed to me that there wasn't a lot of opposition to um, debunk some of what the, uh, what the legislators were doing at, up at the state capitol. Uh, there was, was, at that time, there was one person running a, a lobbying organization who's still around today. That's the Coalition of Connecticut Sportsmen. Uh, pretty much a one-man show, and uh, I mean, he has paid dues members, but they don't really, for the most part, get involved in the lobbying efforts up at the Capitol. So what we decided was that we needed an organization of volunteers that were willing to take the time out of their lives, uh, learn what to do, put the effort into building an organization, and, uh, and that's what we did. We, we met for dinner one night uh, and somewhere in the middle of Connecticut, a restaurant, because these are people from all over Connecticut coming together, right? Yes, there were there were ten of us that met. Actually, there were more than ten that first night, but more than half the people dropped off uh, the first night. So w what we essentially had were um, ten people that went on to found the organization and, and build it from the ground up. So, and, all right. So you got together at that meeting, and you, you you had common interests, and you decided that an organization like this was needed. And so, what what was said in that meeting that you can talk about? Just a, as far as it's the phoenix of it, so to speak, you know? Well, essentially, uh, at that particular meeting, not too much was done that night other than... To bounce ideas. Ob each observing other. each other, okay. really. Finding out what people liked and disliked and what they did. One guy was a pilot. He talked about being a pilot. Safety, but, right? You're right. Myself, uh, I was kind of gauging around the room and, and looking to, to, to see, you know, what was going on, you know, how, how people were reacting. Because the, the idea had been put out to, to build the organization. Some people uh, showed up with the intent of just having a good dinner with other fellow gun enthusiasts. Other people kind of, you know, liked maybe the idea of, of starting a gun rights organization. So what happened was at my end of the table, um, I mean, I went around the room with the clipboard and got made sure I had everybody's direct contact information. Were you the sort of li the liaison for this group? Uh, uh, yes, at, at first. One guy got the restaurant for us to eat in. He confirmed our reservations. But I went around to make sure that there was um, the information, you know, that people would be easily accessible. Got everybody's emails, put together an email chain. Uh, literally, you could take the two tables that were put together, you could take the one table at one end and cut it in half, and those were the people that went about their business. We never heard from them again and our table, the people that were s seated on our side of the room, uh, we went on to found the organization. And that was in February of uh, 2009. So hey, here you have it. We yeah. have uh, nearly, uh, well, over four and a half years later, we have an organization with 9,200 members throughout the state um, that has grown tremendously, especially since the, uh, the Sandy Hook tragedy. You know, and I was going to say, uh, since the, the founding of uh, CCDL, a lot has happened, and a lot has happened in Connecticut. And, and as tragic as, it, as some of these things were, uh, it almost made an organization like this even more necessary, don't you think? Oh, ab absolutely. Yeah. I, I, you know, to, to back it up a little, or, you know, our first couple of years uh, getting involved at the legislature. Um, I mean, I had some organizational skills with being involved with uh, volunteers, and, and that's why I think I was the, the orchestrator of trying to help pull everybody together. Um, but the, the talent pool that we have from the founders, w w they're just immense. The, the people, everybody brought something to the table with some kind of knowledge or experience to help build the organization. So our first year, we had no experience testifying at the legislature. 
what we did was we found somebody who had that experience. Do they have to be like a lawyer or anything? No, or no, no, absolutely no. The public, anybody from from the public can go um, and, and testify as a citizen of the Connecticut if they have an open public hearing. You want them to be somewhat articulate though, so they kind of can be taken seriously and make sense, right? I, you know, ideally. However, I, I do believe that you know, of course, our First Amendment rights being what they are, that sometimes you have somebody show up in the camo and the, you know, the NRA hat or whatever. Right. People are going to show up and they're going to be who they're going to be right. during these sessions. And sometimes some very articulate uh, words may come out of the mouths of uh, people. Looks who, can be deceiving. Ex exactly, yeah. right. So we had uh, somebody that had had some experience um, who we appointed as what we call the legislative uh, advocacy coordinator. Now we've shrunk it to legislative coordinator because it, it was it was too hard to, to utter those words over <laughs> you and over. You can fit it all on yeah, a business right, card. Exactly. You know? right, thank you. So he showed us what to do, and it was amazing. The first year we you know went up and testified on, on a number of gun bills, and we pl had planned a rally at the Capitol. Um, there hadn't been too much going on. But I like to think that those first couple few years, the gun bills that we did testify and that we were very successful at testifying in opposition to, were, um, were it gave us the ability to, to build our, our chops as, as we went along yeah, and, and learn get, the ropes, exactly. learn where to go, what to do in the building, which legislators are, are for or against or, or whatever. Perfect. So yeah. it, it was. It, timing wise, uh, for us to gain experience and knowledge you know, with, the through, with the legislative process, uh, that. Uh, you know that time period was very crucial because when Sandy Hook happened, you know, it, uh, it was uh, there was there was nothing. It was just like a rocket ship ride to, to yeah. the top with uh, with everything that went on. Do you find that politicians in general, and I I, I know the answer to this question, but they, they kind of you know are are they're, they're, for their constituent, they're just kind of doing and saying what they think their constituents want to hear, and it may not be in the interest of, of any, like for example, the CCDL or, or anybody, they're there, they're, I don't want to say they're pawns, but whatever their constituents want, that's what, that's what they say. And it may, you may not agree with it uh, as an organization. Well, you butt heads. Yeah, I mean, some, there, there are some legislators, uh, again, there's, you know, a variety of individuals and a different number of different facets uh, in the legislature and, and as are everywhere. Uh, some of them want to go along and respect the wishes of their constituents. Some of them want to um, take a populist position, which is what I believe many did during Sandy Hook. Some of them are actually, you know, they're elected with the intent of uh, representing the people. But what happens a lot of times once they get elected, they're now in a position where they represent the state, the interest of the state, and right. what's good for the state of Connecticut and the, the bureaucracy that's up there. So. Essentially, you have a legislator that transforms themselves as to a, a person of the people, and now they uh, they will do whatever, whoever seated at the uh, the state capitol, uh, the governor of the state of Connecticut, or uh, you know whatever other echelons there are, uh, they they will act in their interest as opposed to the people. You know, people that are watching the show right now, um, you know, and we've mentioned it a couple of times, the Sandy Hook tragedy. Um, how did how did the, the Connecticut Citizens Defense League did it change? What happened after that day? Were you inundated? What did you do differently after that? Did, did mindsets change? Talk about what what happened shortly after that. Um, well, mindsets did not change. Uh, if anything, we more resolved adapted, than ever. Yes, yeah, yeah. so we we became somewhat more resolute in in, in our message and uh, steadfast with wanting to preserve and, and protect our rights because we knew, you know. People I, would be gunning for Right, you. exactly. Yeah. No pun intended, right? Yeah. So I, I woke exactly. up the morning and went to work and, and everything was a normal work day and like everybody else we saw what started to unfold and it was, the information was slow coming out at first. For a couple hours it was somebody got shot in the foot um, and then there was nothing was revealed too much until everything was disclosed um, and it was, it was devastating. And what we did at first was... Um, we knew that there were going to be folks that were proponents of gun control out there. With uh, they would be the first to start uh, coming after, you know, Second Amendment rights and, and wanting to ban this and ban that. And uh, we really tried to be respectful of the uh, of the families for the first 24 hours. I was contacted literally by uh, every media hundreds of ever, right? hundreds of media organizations that day and then, and then beyond up and up through the legislative session. And did you just have a sort of a moratorium mm -hmm. on that for what 24 48 hours? Yeah, 20, or? right. Yeah, 24 hours where I, I released one little statement out of respect for the families, not going to talk about it uh, uh, right now. And um, 
instantly the, the proponents of gun control were out, ban this, ban but that. the NRA was out right away, too. Well, the NRA actually never released an official statement for, for about two weeks. Right. Again, out of respect. Again, to, out of respect yeah. for, for the families, sure. Because I think um, something that the gun control proponents, I'll refer to them, or the anti-gun lobby, um, we have a lot in common with them that are, are often overlooked. And one is that we both, both sets of organizations, all the, the different, you know, dichotomy of the organizations, we both have uh, respect for life. We both abhor, abhor violence. We both uh, want a safe world for our children to, to grow up in. And we, we want all these things just as they do. I, I think the ultimate difference between the two different mindsets are that we look the, at the constitutionality of the Second Amendment and we look at what the intent was and uh, essentially the Second Amendment itself didn't guarantee us a, a Second Amendment right. It didn't guarantee us the right to car carry and, and bear firearms. What it did was it merely affirmed an pre-existing right. Uh, now you, you had mentioned before Sandy Hook and while you were kind of you know just working the chops you said you know you were able to kind of learn and and get some stuff done but I, I want to give you the opportunity to kind of you know talk about some more specific accomplishments that the CCDL has over the time that you've been in existence. Um, okay, well, sure. Uh, back in uh, 2010, there was a, a big uh, long, uh, long gun registration um, bill that was put out by the uh, um, Department of Public Safety. They floated out through the, um, the Public Safety Committee up at, uh, up at the Capitol, and they really wanted to make everybody register their long arms. Because in Connecticut, you have de facto registration for handguns, so they wanted to um, be able to record who owned what with with uh, both shotguns and, and rifles. And they what they did was they had submitted a bill with uh, very little language to it. It was more of a concept. And uh, the vice president of our organization actually went on and, and, and testified in front of the committee and explained that there are literally hundreds of thousands of firearms that are owned by people in the state of Connecticut that do not have registration numbers on them. They're back before the um, required time period where registration was was uh, was uh, mandated. Yeah, right. So what happened was the uh, Department of Public Safety Committee Chair, the co-chair, Andrea Stillman, who's rep mm -hmm. she's a uh, state senator for this area in Connecticut here, she actually uh, called for a break and came back about 20 minutes later and that entire segment of uh, the long gun registration was pulled out of the bill and they went on and they I believe they passed the rest of the bill it didn't affect gun owners at that from that point forward anymore so but it was something that made sense and it was an accomplishment for sure Connecticut Citizens Defense League yeah right? sure right yeah. and then we had uh, you know the, the year after that which was um, it was after the uh, shooting in, in Manchester Connecticut that uh, you know, the uh, beer distributorship up there they were going for um, magazine restrictions size. They wanted to mandate 10-round uh, magazines, and we, we, we defeated that bill uh, resoundly that year. We had literally hundreds of our members show up and testify, and uh, I think our, our message was heard loud and clear. Um, how about... Uh, I mean, I could go on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, and I'm just thinking, you and I talked off the air. I uh, just recently got my uh, Connecticut pistol permit. And, um, you know, took the class, to, you know, went to live the, the range. And uh, so I have the permit. I haven't, I haven't um, you know, um, gone out and purchased a, a firearm yet sometime down the road. But, you know, I got started down that path. There are actually a couple of other uh, staff members here at the station that have them too. And, you know, I'm pretty happy of the accomplishment I have. I don't, I'm not necessarily in any hurry to get a firearm, but, uh, but I, I'm, you know, I'm glad I took the classes and I'm glad I have it. Right. And, and that's um, and it, it's it's great that there are folks out there like yourself that recognize that they have a right and they will uh, put the their actions in motion to go through the process to be able to, to purchase a handgun if they want. Right. Nobody can you know should force you to get a firearm or own a firearm and and uh, but it's nice to know that if um, if you do want one and when you, you're you ready, choose right. when you're ready and and uh, and you, you strike me as somebody after when we were talking prior to taping that uh, you, as a safe individual who wants to make sure that they absolutely know what they're doing yeah. with the firearm, uh, that's something that our organization strongly encourages. Safety is a big thing. Safety, yeah. safety, right. Because, uh, you know, there's it, it's terrible when we have uh, tragedies that occur, accidental tragedies or, you know, or, or what goes on uh, with some of these people that are 
are, are doing what they do out there. The reason I brought up my uh, pistol permit was because we were talking about some of the accomplishments of the Connecticut Citizens Defense League, and one um, is the like the the the, munis the ordinances of individual municipalities. They were kind of all over the road, and I think one of the things that that you guys did was sort of uh, you know kind of have them all sync up, so to speak, that it was more of a statewide thing and it just made more sense. Mm -hmm. Talk about that a little bit. Sure. Well, um, there were ordinances uh, in New London and in New Britain that, uh, uh, in, in a sense, banned the concealed carrier firearms. And it was a relatively old ordinance, um, or these were old ordinances. What happened was it, it was such a concern to gun owners out there because as law-abiding gun owners, people want to make sure that they are following the law because, you know, heaven forbid, right. they get caught somewhere and their gun's, uh, you know, concealed and it's not supposed to be. And Even if it, it's like a, an old ordinance that isn't enforced, they could easily it, be used against you, right? Sure. Yeah. It, and once that's used against you, it, it's, it's typically a fine and it might not be necessarily a, a criminal charge. But what could happen then is uh, this, the special licensing and firearms unit could, if they chose to, say you're not a suitable person anymore take away and, your, and revoke, take away your right, yeah. revoke your permit and then force you to go through a, a, a lengthy uh, and sometimes expensive appeal process at the state of Connecticut. So meanwhile, you, you're, you're stuck with the inability to defend yourself about an ordinance that you didn't know was even an ordinance. So your, your effort in this area was to sort of just kind of sync up the ordinance so that it's a statewide thing, those few towns that mm -hmm. just were kind of had these outdated things that just made more sense to kind of get everything up to date. Y yes, uh, New London uh, in New Britain, and there were other ordinances uh, in towns that they tried to pass that would restrict the use of firearms after certain hours or certain... I mean, obviously, nobody wants to wake their neighbors up at night, but uh, there's been there's been a, another a number of attempts by municipal uh, um, uh, government uh, agencies out there that want to restrict the use of firearms in some way or another. So, Do, does you and your organization, the way it is right now, the way it's set up as far as the process to get a permit and then the the waiting period to uh, to eventually purchase a firearm, do you like the way that that's set up now, or would you like it to be different? Safe safety issues and uh, just uh, as far as enthusiasts go. You know, I I like that um, I like that people have uh, have the ability to go and get the training beforehand before they get issued the pistol permit. But here in Connecticut, we have a um, a two step process. So if you want a, a firearms permit in the state, you need to go through your local issuing authorities first. Then you know you, they do the background checks, mm -hmm. and then sometimes they interview. Sometimes they do things that go above and beyond what the state statutes require, which um, a person could actually argue against right. and then file an appeal and, and win that way and, and get their permit that way, which again sometimes is a lengthy process. Um, some of the issuing authorities around the state really, uh, they don't, they very simply do not like the fact that the citizens that live in their towns want to carry a firearm for, for self-protection or for whatever reason they want to. Now when you say they don't like it, who you mean? Legislators certain, in Connecticut? No, or not politics? legislators. Certain Certain municipal heads, certain okay. issuing authorities, uh, the chief of police for you know, New Haven, um, West Haven, uh, Hartford, West Hartford, Bridgeport, Waterbury, they, they put... They Those are towns a, where the crime is up a bit there, I would imagine, well, right? Well, right, sure. But yeah. if somebody goes through the background check and they qualify, right. they should be able to get that permit. It shouldn't be held against them regardless of what town they live in. Exactly. So that is the stuff that I really have a problem with. They, they create uh, unnecessary obstacles and they sometimes force people to go through the appeal process. And what will happen in many cases, especially Waterbury, is they will wait to the day of the hearing and then they will decide, okay, we're going to issue now. And, and it, it all goes back to the fact that they just wanted to be a stick in the mud for as long as they could and, and, and give grief to the people that uh, you know, are just very simply trying to uh, follow the law and, and exercise their rights. What happened after? What happens after a tragedy occurs, like a Sandy Hook? Um, is it true that um, you know people's interest in in possibly having gun ownership or uh, actually goes up? Is there more? Do people want to learn more? Uh, is your organization? Mm -hmm. Do you hear more from people that just want to want to start the process? Yeah, well, and right, we, we look to the, um, the statistics that are, are available. We've um, FOIA'd uh, Freedom of Information requests um, that have been sent out to the Special Licensing and Firearms Unit off and on periodically through the last several years by our organization, where we look at the, the trends, and essentially after Sandy Hook, you have any type of violent crime, whether, you know, a mass slaughter or, or whatever you want to call it, uh, 
the incentive for firearms ownership goes up. People want their permits more uh, in Sandy Hook right now. Since, uh, since the tragedy, you hear all about the people that are that, speaking out against firearms. Exactly. They want to the get numbers, rid of them. The numbers of citizens that are in that city uh, or in that town have applied for uh, permits above and beyond what the state average is. The so, silent majority, right? Y yes, right. And, and you know, so, so the, the, I think the media, they portray an image that everybody in Sandy Hook, Connecticut, or, or Newtown are, are all anti-gun right now. And that is absolutely not the case. It wasn't before the Sandy Hook tragedy, and it has not been since then. So there's been numerous articles about the, uh, the rise in pistol permit applications and firearms ownership. Uh, through that area because people want to be able to protect themselves. Uh, one other question I, I had for you was uh, I remember uh, Governor Malloy uh, talking about the sort of the, the, the crackdown on, on gun ownership and one of the th concerns that people had was the possibility of it adversely affecting the gun manufacturers in Connecticut and how about how this could send jobs elsewhere. Was that a concern of yours and your organizations and do, do you still believe that it's a potential problem? Oh, it's absolutely a problem. First and foremost, because a lot of those manufacturers, uh, manufacturers, they, they create those firearms that I personally like to own, and now um, I can't go out and purchase those types of firearms since the law was signed in, into an, in a public. How act. does it affect them once once the law was signed in? The manufacturers. It, well, here's here's how it affects them. First off, they, 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 Governor Malloy did say they can continue to operate with within Connecticut, but they lose a very wherever they're operating from. If they if they're in Connecticut and they they move to another state wherever, they lose the Connecticut market share. Now they can't sell the, their types of firearms, the AR-15 pattern rifles or, or whatever have you, um, back to Connecticut residents. So. You, you know, yeah, that's a that's a that's a fair share of the market, especially in, in an economy where you know, people Jobs are, are businesses premium, are struggling. Yeah. yeah, right, and absolutely. And what it also did was, you know, as far as directly affecting Connecticut was, uh, it opened up a market for, you know, as we know, governors and, and leaders of other states came to Connecticut to woo the uh, these types of businesses away. We've had uh, PTR Industries leave the state, and we have uh, Stag Arms, which is another fairly good sized manufacturer. They're going to be announcing soon where they're going to be relocating to. So they haven't officially said they're leaving the state yet, but. They're you know it's all intense. Yeah. I don't know for fact. I mean, I don't have it. I'm not privy to any inside information. Um, but it, uh, the indicators are that, that it's it's going to happen. They're going to leave the state. So and, you know, and and they manufacture in in New Britain, Connecticut, and and you know that's a couple hundred jobs. And it may not seem like a lot, a couple hundred jobs, but that's a, not just a couple hundred jobs. It's a couple hundred families. That's you know the uh, the lunch counters that are yeah. set up for people. It has that, a domino effect. It, it it does it does. And in, in in my estimation, uh, Governor Malloy was just it just none of that mattered. It, the ends justified the means, and and when the legislators echoed the chorus, something has to be done, and and there needs to be a conversation. Um, this is what we we ended up with in this state. Does the CCDL have a good relationship with the gun manufacturers in the state, or have you in the past, or do you still? And yeah, yeah sure, yeah. absolutely. I mean, you know, we're not, you know, best friends with, with anybody in the in the, the gun industry here in Connecticut, but we on occasion, uh, particularly this this past year, would often see each other at the legislature and uh, and co-testify together on on various uh, things that we were trying to protect and defend. Um, the National Shooting Sports Foundation, which is based in Newtown, they're a, what they are is they're a uh, they're a manufacturer's representative. They they represent thousands of manufacturers uh, for whatever their their firearms components are or whatever uh, additional components are that uh, anything that has to do with the shooting sports and uh, and we've. Um, stood shoulder to shoulder with them and, and, and some of these other manufacturers. Talk, talk to me about a lawsuit that you're a plaintiff in right now that I was told that it's okay that I can uh, bring this up on the show. So for legal purposes, I guess it's okay to mention and talk about. Or is it not? It depends. Okay. Uh, I mean, there's... Whatever what, you can say. About yeah, it. right. Uh, yeah, essentially, go ahead and ask your question. And if there's, uh, if I can't um, answer it, I, you know, I will... Uh, All right. Well, can you, uh, for, for those that are unfamiliar with it, is there, is there sort of a broad description of what's going on that you can mention without getting into sure. legalities? Absolutely. Um, we, um, we took the initiative, as, as we saw the writing on the wall and... and and that there were more than likely was going to be a uh, severe restrictive uh, gun control um, package passed. What we did was we started getting ready ahead of time, um, started earmarking funds uh, for the, for a, a major lawsuit, and uh, 
So what happened was we opened up our, our bank account and, and let people know they come on, come along and fill it up because yeah. we're going to be we're not going to be just getting uh, uh, some lawyer that you know maybe has filed Second Amendment cases before. We want the very best lawyers because we absolutely, at the end of the day, cannot afford to lose. So um, we uh, we took in some money initially and then we obtained our lawyer uh, who is uh, based out of New York. And uh, he's prepared, and the team of lawyers are prepared to be able to argue all the way up through the, uh, through the uh, Supreme Court if need be. So, you know, good lawyers, if you want the best, they're, they're expensive mm -hmm. um, because you can't, at the end of the day, leave anything to chance. You cannot afford to uh, short any of the, the briefs or documents or research or legwork that needs to be done. So, and those are hours that you need to be able to pay for. So what our organization has done was uh, um, we've teamed up with the Coalition of Connecticut Sportsmen, um, we are doing right now, anyways, the majority of the fundraisers. I know, uh, I know, um, Bob Crook has got something in the works for October. He's got a banquet going on, and I, I think uh, some of the some of the funds from that banquet are going to come to the litigation fund. But uh, we have hosted a lot of fundraisers right now through the uh, over the past uh, five months uh, since the law passed, and we have more planned for the future. And one of the events is, uh, you know, a poker run that's. Uh, Slated for this weekend. By the time your show airs, right. Well, that, that all your fundraisers, the, the, everything will be on the website. Correct. Sure. Okay. What is the website? Because we're running out of time. I want to make sure we get to that. Okay. Our, our website uh, for your uh, viewers is uh, www.ccdl.us. All right. And there you can find all our our activities that we're involved in. And if they want to get involved with the organization, they can go there too as an initial yep. point for contact. There's you can membership to click join on the membership, and and it'll walk you right through what you need to do. It's very simple. Nice. All right, Scott Wilson, the president of the Connecticut Citizens Defense League, uh, learned a lot today. Pleasure having you on the show. I'll have to have you back again because there need, we need to talk. Oh, more. I've, I've got okay. more. I held back. <laughs> oh, you held back. All right, so we'll definitely have you on again. Uh, in the meantime, I'm Sean Murphy. This is for the record. You can see this show and many others on our YouTube site. Until next time, take care.